Welcome everyone. Again, my name is Wen Li. I'm the Director of Online Media and Engagement at the Center for a New American Dream. We'd like to welcome you to our webinar today about how to start a time bank and skill exchange in your community. The time banking is a really exciting topic um, and we are so pleased that over 300 people have registered for this webinar and it just shows how exciting and uh, interested people, how uh, interested people are in this topic and how it's sort of a movement that's spreading across the country as well as the world. Okay, so um, before we introduce our wonderful speakers for today, I wanted to introduce a little bit about the Center for a New American Dream um, and also generally what time banking is. So. The Center for a New American Dream is a national nonprofit, and our mission statement is uh, up on the screen. The Center for a New American Dream helps Americans to reduce and shift their consumption to improve quality of life, protect the environment, and promote social justice. And we do this with three different program areas. The first is redefining the dream, really asking folks to reevaluate what the American dream really stands for and what we want and what we need to be happy. Um, the second program area is beyond consumerism. We like people to really shift the American dream away from consumerism, from commercialism and materialism, and to really focus on what makes them happy, only buying things that they really need, not what advertisers tell us that we want. And when we do buy things, to buy things in a responsible way. And the last program area is collaborative communities, which is the program that this webinar series is a part of. So with collaborative communities, we really want to give people um, hands-on practical tools that they can use to start projects in their communities. So this webinar series is part of the collaborative communities program. Um, this is uh, one of a long series um, to give people um, information and advice as to how to start up projects in their community. So today we're talking about time banking. Okay, so what is time banking? Um, I'm sure that a lot of you are very experienced with time banking and a lot of you are very new to the concept. So just to give a really broad strokes overview, the concept of time banking involves using time as currency instead of money. So for example, I've laid out sort of the, uh, some uh, typical steps that might happen with time banking. So first you are spending one hour doing something for someone in your community. Maybe you mow someone's lawn, okay? So if you spend one hour helping somebody, then you then earn one time dollar. Because one hour equals one time dollar. Then you put your time dollar into your time bank. And then you can spend your time bank at another, you can, sorry, you can spend your time dollar at another time by helping, by having someone help you and do something for you. So maybe you want to spend your time dollar to have someone come and give you a cooking lesson or have someone come and, you know, take you to the airport and give you a ride. And then you repeat. <laughs> um, so time banking is such a exciting and creative way to exchange skills and resources without using money. So this is a really fun diagram um, that I got from uh, California Federation of Time Banks website. And <clears throat> I know you probably can't read all the little words, but the point is to show just how um, diverse and various time banking, uh, time banking activities could span. So we have people giving, you know, guitar lessons to somebody, somebody helping people with taxes, you know, having a dinner, giving someone a ride, you know, reading to someone's kids, helping out in the yard. And it really just comes full circle because you do something for somebody, they do something back for you. Um, and it's, it's really sort of organic and exciting way to interact with folks in your community. So, why is time banking a good idea? Um, I'm sure that all of you can think of a lot of reasons. Um, it's fair in the sense that everybody's time is valued 
exactly the same. One hour is one hour is one hour is one hour. So um, a doctor's time is the same as a custodian's time, is the same as a teacher's time. Um, and a, a seven-year-old's time is valued the same as an 80-year-old's time. Um, one hour is an hour. Um, another reason why it's so exciting is because it's totally free. There's absolutely no money exchanged in any time banking activities. Um, and, and it's not tied to the state of the economy. So um, a really interesting real life example is happening in Europe right now, in Spain, where they're experiencing a really uh, severe financial crisis right now. Um, hundreds of time banks have sprung up in Spain um, for folks to connect and provide each other with resources, even if they um, are short on money. So it is uh, something that makes communities more resilient. It's a fulfilling thing to do. Um, it's a group of people who decide to work together and join together for a common good. It connects people with others in the community. It builds trust and it strengthens community bonds. And of course, it's fun. It's so much fun. And you have opportunities to do things that maybe you never thought you would be doing, like taking belly dancing lessons or learning how to make jam and can food. So um, those are just some reasons why it's a really great idea. Okay. Time banking is a growing movement, as I mentioned earlier. Um, this is a map from Time Banks USA showing all the registered time banks in their system across the United States. There are over 200 listed. And this is just within the Time Banks USA network. So um, there's actually way more than this. So um, it's really exciting to see. And as you can see, it's all over the United States, a lot in urban areas, but also in rural areas. It's in blue states, it's in red states, and it's for everybody. So um, hopefully your town will be next, and uh, we'd love to see more blue dots all over the country. Okay, so let's talk about who we're going to hear about from today. I'm sure you guys don't want to hear me talk anymore. So we have three wonderful speakers with us today. We have uh, Janine Cristiano, Mashi Bleck, and Mira Luna. And I'm just going to bring them up on the screen so that they can say hello to you. There's Janine, there's Mashi, there's Mira. Um, you're gonna hear from all three of them, but they're just gonna wave hi to you for now. Um, we're gonna take turns to hear from each of them and they will tell you about their experience um, starting up a time bank in their community. So Janine is the founder of Arroyo Time Bank in the Los Angeles area. Um, and she's also the co-director of Arroyo Steco Network of Time Banks, which has now morphed from the Arroyo Time Bank. And she'll go into more detail about that. Mashi Black is the director of the Community Connections Time Bank, the Visiting Nurse Service of New York in New York City. Um, and she will tell you about um, how she got Time Bank started over there. And then uh, last but not least, Mira Luna is the founder of the Bay Area Community Exchange in the San Francisco Bay Area. So again, we will hear from um, all three of them um, in order. So um, I'm going to put them so, all right. Okay, great. So just to give everyone an overview of these three organizations, here are some um, snapshots of each organization. So the Orio Seco Network of Time Banks was founded by um, Janine, uh, who you just saw, as well as Autumn Rooney. It serves the Pasadena and Greater Los Angeles area in California. Um, and it is actually a merger of two other time banks, um, the Arroyo Time Bank, which started in 2009, and the Echo Park Time Bank, which started in 2008. They merged together in 2011 to form the Arroyo Seco Network of Time Banks. And Janine will tell you all about that. Um, it is a nonprofit organization. They are currently in the process of um, applying for 501c3 status. There's about 800 members in this time bank. And in terms of staff, they have about one to three part-time, um, depending on the projects and depending on funding. 
um, but they have they rely heavily on folks who earn time dollars to do administrative work for the organization. Okay. Next, we have the um, VNSNY Community Connections Time Bank, um, founded by Mashi Black, who you just saw, um, as well as Anna Mirares. Sorry, I said her name wrong. <laughs> um, this is in New York, New York, started in 2006. Um, so this time bank is actually part of a very large organization. The Visiting Nurse Service uh, of New York is the largest um, home healthcare organization in the country. It's a not-for-profit. Um, and they have um, 2,700 people in this time bank, so it's very large. Um, they have 10 full-time staff and over 150 volunteers to help out with this organization. And then we have the Bay Area Community Exchange founded by Mira Luna. Um, this serves the San Francisco and greater Bay Area in California. Started in 2009, um, it is, is a fiscally sponsored nonprofit with about 1,800 folks um, as members. Um, and um, they don't have paid staff. They have a lot of volunteers and folks who um, contribute their time um, in other non-monetary ways. So that's a sort of a snapshot of the three organizations that we're going to hear about today. So once again, um, we um, are going to take questions from the audience. So we are going to start now with brief presentations. Each, um, each presenter is going to talk about how their time bank got started, um, how their time banks work logistically, um, and also share some challenges and successes that they experienced when they um, were starting up their organization. Um, as you have questions for the um, speakers, please um, type them into the question box, or um, if it's something that you would like to put more publicly, you can put it in the chat box. Okay. Um, after each presenter has spoken, um, I'll go over some more um, resources that are available to learn more about the topic, and then we're going to devote the rest of the time for questions from the audience. All right. So without further ado, the first speaker is going to be Janine Cristiano, and I'm going to bring her back on stage over here. Great. All right, Janine, can you say something so I can make sure your audio is working? I'm here. I can hear Excellent. you. Excellent. We can hear you as well. Okay, so uh, Janine, take it. Okay, great. Um, so uh, as Wen was saying, uh, the I am uh, the co-director now of the Arroyo Seco Network of Time Banks, which uh, is a merger of the Arroyo Time Bank and Echo Park Time Bank. Um, and um, the base, basically the way this happened, oh, and when can I have the next slide? And I'll talk about how Arroyo started and then how we merged. Um, we've always, the Arroyo Time Bank has always worked closely with Echo Park Time Bank. Um, it was, I was actually inspired by hearing about the Echo Park Time Bank. I'd never heard of time banking um, prior to them, prior to that, and it was completely coincidental. Um, someone had mentioned it um, to me, a, a patron at the library that I was working at, and the concept resonated with me. And so the minute I heard that, I was like, what's a time bank? And just started researching like crazy and reading all the different articles. I ended up contacting Autumn. I wanted to join the Echo Park Time Bank, but because they were very focused on their neighborhood, there was, you know, they, they encouraged they encouraged people to start their own, and I kind of fell for the bait and just decided to jump in with no prior knowledge really of starting an organization or time banking or alternative economies, but just really with the strong desire that this is the way people should interact with each other, that there, there's something better um, instead of the status quo um, way of doing things and getting things done and interacting with your neighbors. So um, the way we started was I basically, I let Autumn know and the Echo Park Time Inc. know that I was interested in starting my own in the Pasadena area, which is the neighborhood just north of the area that they're in. Um, sent an email to some of my contacts, letting them know about this new project that I was starting, posted a couple flyers at the coffee shop that it was gonna, the first meeting was going to be held at, and just waited. And it started um, 
you know, eight people showed up. I knew one of them, and the rest had just kind of, I guess, heard, you know, through the grapevine that there was going to be a time bank meeting. Um, and we started from there. So basically, this I suggest when you start, just really start simply and take stock of um, who's interested in the community, what is everybody, what is bringing everyone to the table, um, who has time to do what, um, and and go from there. And so you know, we knew we had to get more members, so there was you know a small component of outreach. Um, you know, we had to you know manage. Um, we had to do research, more research. We had to manage um, the new members who were coming in, so that was something. Um, but and we just started to, you know, and we wanted to create um, interactions for people. So we started organizing really small, simple events um, like potlucks, um, meetings at coffee shops, and things like that. And just encouraging people to just take that first leap, make an exchange. Um, so that is basically the, the very the logistics of starting a, a time bank in the very beginning. And um, you know, from that point on, and actually even to this day, we are member based. We're not part of another organization, um, and we're pretty grassroots and depend heavily on our members for um, you know a lot of the administrative work and you know making the exchanges, coming up with ideas, leading projects. That inspire them, um, and you know, and, and encourage others to use the time bank in really creative ways. As for our funding, um, we had nothing in the beginning to start. Um, the software we chose was uh, was uh, from Time Banks USA. It was Community Weaver. Um, you, you know, I I paid for the first uh, intro package. Um, after that, and then the first, you know, small amount of supplies and whatnot. After that, we, you know, we wanted to do more. We, there was more flyers to be printed, um, you know, things for the potluck, um, stuff like that. And so we decided to do a group garage sale, and we did that for the first couple years, and that's how we um, survived basically um, as we grew. Um, and the creativity of our members grew, and all these projects started springing up. We knew that we had to um, think a little bigger, and so um, after a couple years, decided to go down the nonprofit route and um, started all the paperwork for that. And we're still in the middle of it. Um, also, um, as we were growing, Echo Park Time Bank was growing and dealing with a lot of the same challenges. So because we worked so closely together. Um, you know, we decided let's not let's not compete. You know, let's not and do double work. Let's not have these two nonprofits in this very basically in the same region dealing with the same uh, issues. Let's collaborate, and then so that's how we merged uh, in 2011. And can you see the next slide? Happy, thank you. And so how we work is um, we, we uh, use Time Banks uh, USA's software, which is Community Weaver. And it recently went through an upgrade, and it's continuing to go through upgrades, which um, is exciting and challenging at the same time. Um, and our, um, we have a team, a local tech team, that is, work, is currently working on the next version of Community Weaver um, for staffing. Like I said earlier, we're primarily volunteer-based. Um, we, we've had different iterations of what our kind of core leadership uh, group is called. Um, they've been called steering committees, kitchen cabinets, um, and I think that's probably what we're going to be calling them. Each neighborhood within, it, each neighborhood within our network of time banks um, will eventually have its own kitchen cabinet. Right now, we have a handful, um, but we're growing and, again, encouraging each neighborhood to, um, to strengthen um, their, you know, their own specific neighborhood. But um, we've uh, decided to uh, combine a lot of the 
um, of, of the uh, tasks like um, orientations, uh, website updating, etc. Uh, we don't collect any fees. Uh, it's uh, but we do in the future just for sustainability. For legal issues, we've been lucky. We've been keeping it really simple. But I really suggest um, looking and maybe even contacting the selk.org, which is a legal center in San Francisco or in Oakland, I believe, that specializes in the, in the sharing economy. And it's a great resource. Can I have a uh, next slide? I'll briefly go over our successes and challenges. Talk about the challenges first because it's really important to know about them. It's a lot of work, so there's burnout from leaders. A lot of people step up in the beginning, realize that they can't do it with the current, um, you know, with their workload, family obligations, etc. So that's hard because you gain a certain momentum and then people leave, and it does, the momentum does die a little bit. Member retention for the same reason. People get excited in the beginning, but aren't ready to make that big leap into like. You know, letting a stranger who is their neighbor into their home. Um, and then uh, just rapid growth. We have 30 to 50 new member requests every month. And just the administration of it is really hard. And as we grow, creating consensus is really, really tough. But the successes are great. I mean, it's all of our members are so creative um, and they've had amazing projects. It just feels good, which isn't like a great scientific. Um, you know, statistical uh, thing, but it, it, I feel better about my community. <laughs> I feel empowered and optimistic and, you know, and I see so many amazing creative people and I interact with so many, such a larger, more diverse group of people than I ever had in my life. So that's it. That's the, that's Arroyo Seco Network of Time Banks in a nutshell, basically. I'm delighted to be here, everybody. Um, I've been a time banker for 25 years now. It's really hard to believe. Um, I consider myself one very lucky gal. I was hired back in 1987 as part of a grant from the Robin Wood Johnson Foundation where they were testing the time bank model in five sites across the country. And it was basically just an idea, and we had to figure out whether it could work or not. And now, today, as you're hearing, there are time banks all over this country and all over the world. Uh, I've been a kept, what I call a kept time bank woman, and that means to me that I've always been, my time banks have been sponsored by uh, organiz community organizations, uh, in this case, two very large healthcare organizations. And uh, I have been amazed to see the difference, the life-changing differences it has made in so many of our members' lives. And I made matches 20 years ago that actually still exist today. Um, it, since 2006, I've been running the Time Bank, as you heard, based in the Visiting Nurse Service of New York. And they jumped on it as soon as they heard about the idea, and they thought it would be a great resource for uh, to support their aging in place strategies as well as a resource for the communities they serve and uh, as well as for caregivers who have a wide variety of needs. Uh, our time bank is free and is open to all. We have ages 7 to 99 currently. Uh, we chose not to launch in all of New York City. This is a big town and we felt very strongly that small plus small equals big. And uh, we have seen too many time banks fail. They tried to cover too wide a territory. So we selected uh, targeted communities. Um, the ones we selected have large immigrant communities. And we made a commitment to, um, to being accessible. Now, that is that has made our time bank wonderfully rich, but it has also been, honestly, a huge challenge for us um, particularly in the Chinese-speaking communities we serve where there are so many dialects. Um, we have the luxury of having been able to hire uh, bilingual and, in many cases, trilingual staff that are dedicated to each of the hubs. And we also have 
our members, over 150 of our members helping us manage uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. We could certainly not have uh, been successful without them. Um, another key to our success is our partnerships with um, community organizations. We have over 125 of them, and they have so much to give and receive from the Time Bank, and they have the space that we don't have in each of the communities, and they have the relationships and the trust of the, of the residents of those communities. We also have over um, a lot of business partners, and we have over 280 local businesses that have joined with us, and they we promote them to the, our membership, and then in exchange they give a discount to the members. We have a lot of individual exchanges, but we also have a ton of group exchanges. Our members are leading weekly classes and workshops and activities, and that's uh, very exciting for us. Uh, we track everything in a database that uh, we created in-house, and it is not accessible to the members, um, but you have to understand that only half of our members have internet access, and only half of them speak English. So even if it was accessible to them, you know, theoretic, you know, theoretically, the reality is they wouldn't be able to benefit greatly from it. So our staff um, help broker matches, but also our members broker their own matches. And once they meet, we organize a lot of activities, and once the members meet, they, the trust develops, and once the trust develops, the exchanges happen on their own, and the members organize that. Um, we, due to liability concerns, um, we made a decision here to um, limit the types of services that the members exchange. Our scope of services primarily include non-licensed services, except for driving. Um, so in terms of some of the challenges, we, because of liability concerns, um, there's also a pretty labor-intensive onboarding process for screening, and we've also had to manage, manage the rapid growth and a demand to expand to other neighborhoods. People are knocking on our doors every day to you know, try to see if we can work with their communities. And because we've grown so quickly, you know, keeping it personal has been a major challenge. Our members have recorded over 175,000 hours of exchange, but we have documented that is way, way underreported, and we have that's a big challenge for us. Um, once the members become friends, they forget about the recording. Um, we are very excited to have, be able to document how the exchanges cross are the divides of age, income, and ethnic backgrounds. Uh, we have also been able, we're funded to do some research to measure outcomes and the members. We're very excited to hear the members reporting improvements in physical health, mental health, cost savings, increased trust, stronger social networks, decreased isolation, improved quality of life. I mean, how often are you really going to have 85-year-olds telling you that their health is improving? We thought that was really cool. Uh, some final thoughts. Uh, firstly, you need a vision for what you want to accomplish. You need to figure out if the time bank is the right tool to help you reach those goals. Uh, you need a group of people, as you heard, to, to work with you on, and make it happen. Uh, you need a business plan. I can't stress that enough. You need a budget. You need a business plan. And you need a long-term sustainability plan. I have seen way too many time banks um, start with a lot of energy and enthusiasm and then just fade over time. Um, you need a design and a structure for your particular time bank. You need to decide whether you're going to be standalone, whether you're part of a community organization. And finally, you need lots and lots of passion. You need lots of patience, and you need lots of perseverance. Thank you. Sorry about the Thank you so much. Sorry about the slides. I forgot to tell you to <laughs> change slides. Oh, that's OK. <laughs> we, were, we were on it. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna take Mashi off stage there. Thanks so much, Mashi. That was great. Um, I have also I'm also really appreciating seeing a lot of um, chatter going on in the chat box, um, and so a lot of people are asking some questions. And I see that there are representatives from other time banks who are also on this call. Really appreciate you guys sharing your knowledge. And um, you know, Janine and Mashi, um, while uh, Mira is giving her talk, if you guys want to um, interact with folks in the chat box, go for it. Um, I think that the, the, the chat conversations are really valuable. 
Um, thanks also for folks who are sending in questions. I've already received over 20 questions and they're all really great. Um, but before we go into the questions, we want to hear from our last speaker. And I'm going to change the slide here. This is going to be Mira Luna from the Bay Area Community Exchange. Um, and she's going to talk about her experience working in the San Francisco Bay Area. Can you the case? Hello, uh, so we let me mute and we can put my off. Okay. So um, then we, we had to choose a software and we surveyed all the software that existed and we found one um, that we actually thought was the best and it was free. And um, Tom Brown of Open Source Currency set it up for us. And now we share um, this open source software with communities throughout the world. Um, and we've adapted a lot to our local community and what they need, which is the our community has a lot of technological requirements because it's a very high-tech community um, in the Bay Area. And um, we also don't have a lot of staffing resources. So the software works really well in that scenario where we don't have somebody to do a lot of connecting. The software does that for us. Can you hear me? Okay. So we do have, um, we do not have any paid staff. Um, we formed with a volunteer collective um, that's a fiscally sponsored nonprofit. So we don't do a lot of administration or um, finances. We do have some administrative functions, um, but they're covered by the volunteer collective. And we have uh, committees that serve different functions, like financial, um, like fundraising, tech, administrative outreach events and partnerships, and um, a lot of that volunteer time is paid for in hours, um, but some of it's not, some of it's just volunteer work. Um, we have gotten a couple of grants, um, they've each been $1,000, but for the first year we had no funding at all, and we seem to operate fine without that. Um, we've tried to keep our expenses low, knowing that funding may be there and may not. It's great if it's there, but we shouldn't base our home on it, because um, that seems less sustainable to us. I know it's um, it is helpful to have funding for a staff person. Um, and also, if the funding goes away, then maybe you don't have staff. <laughs> so um, we have never charged fees. Um, we wanted to make the time bank as accessible as possible to the lowest income folks and to make sure as many people got on the time bank as fast as possible so that there would be lots of services offered. And so the time bank is growing really quickly. Um, in just three years, it's grown to 1,800 members. And continues to grow at a record pace. Um, let's see. Legal issues. Uh, we do have a waiver, um, although waivers are not really good in California. <laughs> um, and we explain to people that their, their transactions are, are between each other. And we have had to moderate a couple times when there has been conflict, but it's been minimal. And the one time we did have problems with the person decided to leave voluntarily. Um, we've had very few problems. Um, but there are a couple of legal stipulations. One, everybody's hour must be equal. And there can be no monetary equivalence or contracts used. By monetary equivalence, I mean you can't charge um, three hours for a bike that's like $30 in the marketplace. So once you start getting into that monetary equivalent, you start becoming uh, possibly subject to taxes and therefore um, people may lose their state benefits if, if their work is taxable, then it's considered income. And when you have income, then you cannot continue to re receive state benefits. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. OK, just a second. Um, Oh, let me just mention, we did choose um, a really large geographic area, which is the Bay Area. And um, I agree with, Ma with Mashi that it's good to organize on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis. Although um, we wanted to get as many services as possible, and people tra travel throughout the Bay Area on a daily basis for work and play and um, home. They commute a lot. So, um, and the other reason was that everybody was contacting us saying, I want to start a time bank. And it's a lot of work to start a time bank. So we decided to 
um, host the time for the entire Bay Area, but let people start groups and organize in their own neighborhoods using the same software. And then they could trade amongst each other on the same system if they couldn't get what they needed in their own neighborhoods. So our outreach methods have been um, to do larger events. Um, we did a time Day holiday fair. You can see a picture on the screen from that. Uh, we had over 300 people. Charles Eisenstein came to speak, and people traded goods um, as holiday gifts and bought them with time dollars. Um, we had a homestead Skillshare festival, which had uh, over 350 people and 40 workshops, and it was all paid for with time. Um, people got in using hours, and they also, um, they also paid the teachers for the work in hours and the musicians and people who bought food. Um, but having these events has also boosted our membership um, registrations by about a factor of 10 around the time of the, the fair, the Skillshare, um, about a month before and a, and a few weeks afterwards. Um, each week, it's about 10% more, and 10 times more registrations. We also go to a lot of other people's events. So if somebody's having a conference on economics or sustainability, or um, healthy aging, things like that. Um, we host workshops there and sign people up for the time bank as well um, and do public speaking. Um, we also have a lot of partners. Um, we choose our partners pretty selectively, um, either for an organization that has a large membership that we want to reach out to as a target, um, like um, we work with a group that works with Latino immigrants, um, also a group that works with um, seniors and people with disabilities, um, and we, we work with the local bike kitchen so people can come and fix their bikes using hours and also get volunteer credits um, for volunteering at the bike kitchen. Um, these partners have really expanded our membership as well because once we convince them we do a presentation, we help them with a project for the organization, then we um, outreach to their own membership and say, you should join the time bank. They host events for us. So we have this very decentralized organizing strategy where we um, get people in their own neighborhoods, in their own community centers, in their own organizations uh, to do events on our behalf. And, and we'll come and do maybe a presentation, but um, usually they host the entire event themselves, and we encourage them to do so with our support. Uh, we also have partners that um, that provide services that the community needs as well. Um, so I think in the, the bicycle kitchen, um, a local healthcare clinic, um, those are very needed services in low income communities. And so we partner with them for them to accept hours and also to pay their volunteers in hours, which they have a lot of volunteers that need, um, need support because they want higher income people that are just volunteering in their spare time. Um, Let's see. We also we do a monthly newsletter to keep members up to date and remind them that the time bank exists and um, all the cool things you can do with it, the new organizations that have joined. Um, we respond to a lot of media. We've had numerous articles written about base and that also increases our membership a lot. Um, some of the challenges getting people to use it, it takes some orienting and some live trading to get it going. Often people have psychological barriers to using the time bank. Um, for example, trust issues. And um, we built a, a trust system into the time bank in that you can see every transaction that everybody's ever made and the comments that they've made about them. Um, but we also often have to talk people through the process of like how, how you could have a safe transaction, how you would check references. Um, and then it just requires another level of, of trust to get there, and, and we have to kind of break through um, our previous experiences in the mainstream economy and how that's affected us. So in some ways, it's a, it's a psychological and it's a cultural project of change um, that kind of has to go with it. Um, let's see what else. When was the last one on the last slide? <laughs> you want to be on the last slide? Yeah, well, the, the previous one was the last. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, yeah, successes. So, um, one thing that we've done is, because of all the partnerships that we've had with reputable organizations in the community um, and speaking at public events and things, we've established a very positive reputation in the community. 
So people come to us and ask us for partnerships. Um, the city of San Francisco is now interested in partnering with, with us for um, the Department of Healthy Aging, and, um, and that kind of increases our, our credibility and our reach. Again, through our decentralized organizing strategy, we also reach a lot more people. Um, let's see. So we don't try to do everything ourselves. We get other people to do things and encourage them to consider it their, their time bank. And the next slide. So I, I recently wrote an article, um, which will be published, I think, Tuesday on shareable.net. And um, it goes into much more detail about um, a lot of different points that I have on this page, but um, many more. Um, it's really important to find a group of people that have similar goals and that are easy to get along with um, because we've had a lot of conflict over, over these years uh, with people who want to start their own projects. I would encourage them to start their own. <laughs> um, but people have different goals and agendas and different ideas about where it should go. So it's good to start with a, people, a group of people who have a lot of common ground. Um, define your goals and prioritize them. Do you want to work with seniors? Do you want to work with low-income people? Do you want to um, promote sustainability? Do you want to promote ride-sharing, um, education? What do you want to do? Um, this will help you um, in your strategy of how to outreach and how you work with people, your partnerships. Um, it will also help you pick your tool. And so sometimes um, we, we don't even just use the time bank. We use things, tools like gift circles. We use um, like posting boards where people can post offers and requests. We do use paper currency occasionally to get people started with the idea, especially people who haven't used the computer a lot. And, and will not be able to, to regularly check their email. Um, but a time bank may, may not actually be the most appropriate tool, and you need to consider that. Um, it may be a good tool once you've scaled up, um, or possibly a paper currency may be the best tool for, for your area. Only you know that, and you have to test it with groups that you want to work with. Um, the next point is um, do your homework and get a mentor. There's a lot of um, research that's been written on time banks, and Mashi's done some really great studies. Um, but in general, currencies um, are just starting to be more and more researched and documented, and, and there's some resources online to, to learn about this. Community Currency Magazine is one. Um, and if you have a, a time bank that looks like something, the kind of model that you want to start, contact them and see if they'll um, check in with you occasionally and answer your questions. Because you'll make a lot of mistakes along the way, but it's better if you um, at least try to learn some of your mistakes through somebody else. <laughs> um, develop partnerships and take them seriously. Um, I think I mentioned this a lot throughout my talk already. Um, but it's really important to not just go do a presentation and then walk away, because often people won't be able to get things started. You need to do, actually mentor them and uh, keep checking back with them, see how it's working for them, and keep tweaking it along the way. Um, Mm -hmm. Because it's not the easiest, most intuitive for them to learn. But if you pick, so, pick for example, a good way to start a, a partnership is to, to do a presentation to their staff and then um, pick a project that they want to work on. Do they want to get more food out into the community? Do they want to upgrade their website? Do they just need more volunteers? And work with them to use the time rate to meet those needs. Um, the next one is keep the circulation flowing, match unmet needs with underused resources. Um, identify what your communities need, and then use the time bank to make that happen, and that will prove it, um, its value in the community. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Mira. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. Uh, sorry about the technical snafu. Um, I wanted to, um, before we take questions, um, and I do want to make sure to try to answer as many questions as we can in the short time that we have left. Um, talk about some more resources that are available online because there's a lot more. Um, I'm sure all of you still have questions, um, and there's a lot of resources online that can help you answer those questions. So first, um, the Center for a New American Dream has a guide to sharing, which includes a step-by-step -step guide on starting a time bank. Um, so if you go to this website, you will see it. And um, I will uh, have all of these resources available emailed to you and on um, the uh, time banking website on our um, website. 
I said that twice. But anyway, so don't, you don't have to write all this down really fast right now. I just wanted to let you know that these um, resources are out there. Okay, Time Banks USA, um, which is a huge network of time banks that will give you, uh, will let you use their software so that you can set up your time bank online. Please check them out. It's a really great resource, timebanks.org. Tons of people are using it. Um, also, um, if you want to check out a really cool um, like seven tips for a successful time bank, go to California Federation of Time Banks. They have a really great um, sort of starter kit and advice for folks who want to start. Uh, Sustainable Economies Law Center, Janine mentioned earlier. And shareable.net is just a wonderful website talking about how to share things more. And there's some great tip sheets about time banks on there as well. Okay, unfortunately, we only have a couple minutes left for questions, but I do want to bring um, folks um, back on the air. Um, the most common question that I received in the um, questions tab was the question about liability um, and the question about how, uh, how you guys have um, address liability issues um, and to overcome people who uh, don't trust other people. Um, people are, are um, uncomfortable with bringing a stranger into their home. Um, what, are some, um, what are some tactics that you guys have used in your time banks to, um, to address that? And either Mashi or Janine can speak up and uh, Mira, you can type into the chat box. Well, I can start from an organizational perspective because like, I spent the first few months uh, here talking about liability and figuring out what would work. Uh, the good news is, is that in all my 25 years of being a time banker, I'm really not aware of lawsuits. As litigious as our society is, we still not tending to do volunteering. Uh, that being said, you have to have coverage if you're part of an organization and we did not need to purchase additional coverage to cover the organization because they we checked and they were we are covered as a program of the organization under their umbrella policy we did choose to cover to purchase volunteer insurance for our members um, it's it is reasonably inexpensive uh, through an organization called CIMA, C-I-M-A, and you don't have to purchase it for each member, you have to purchase it for the amount of members that are typically exchanging at any given time. Uh, so, you know, in terms of how you, how you get, address the trust issues, it's a huge issue here because we're bringing people together that are from very different backgrounds. And my best recommendation would be people don't have to meet in their homes. They, they sort of learn to trust us. They see the process they go through for the screening, and they realize that everybody has been through that process. But you don't have to meet in a home unless you're doing a home repair. You can meet in the local coffee shop. You can meet in the park. So, and through the, the best thing is for members to meet during time bank activities. And once they meet face to face, then that, a lot of the trust issues melt away. Janine, do you have anything? Yeah, for us. Yeah, um, we will. We have people sign a waiver during uh, the membership application process. Uh, we go through just tips and advice during our orientation. And um, since we are starting our nonprofit organization, um, we will be purchasing volunteer insurance. Um, the trust issue. I think it's a great idea just to get people interacting in environments where they're comfortable. Um, as Mashi said, like not exactly inviting someone in your home, off, you know, initially, but hosting. I've noticed that hosting group activities, um, garden projects, potlucks, getting people to, um, to interact that way breaks the ice, and you start seeing the same people at the group events, and then you get comfortable, and then you can start doing um, uh, the more uh, personal exchanges. Nice, great. Thanks so much. Uh, since I received our. Um, can you exchange time dollars for material goods? Um, and also, um, what do you do if someone's teaching a class for multiple people? Um, how do the hours work like that? Does the teacher get everyone's, do they earn how many hours of the people that are there? Um, I'll answer that first because we've been really experimenting with that. Um, we have, um, last year we did um, a urban farmers market and it's transforming into something we're calling the marketplace. And basically, um, what we've decided is it's best that the actual object um, 
for the actual object, it's either a gift or um, the person who is receiving that object um, pays some, you know, uh, materials fee, and then the cost of either acquiring it, making it, um, you know, cultivating this uh, this uh, material thing is um, that's what you pay a time dollar for. So that's how we, that's one of the way, that's the model that we're using, and it seems to work out um, pretty well. What was the second part of the question, then? So it's like one person is teaching a class or working with several people. How, how do the hours work out that way, and, the time um, dollars? Yeah, so our instructors each earn um, as much, as many hours as it takes to prep for the class, do the class, and then clean up uh, for the class. And so anything that's involved in the class, they earn hours for promoting it, um, et cetera. And then um, each of the members pays the time bank. Great, excellent. Um, so I wanna be sensitive of everyone's time and it's um, three minutes past the hour and, and we were supposed to end three minutes ago. So um, I do wanna um, officially close the webinar for now, but I do wanna say that um, if you uh, put a question in the question box and we didn't answer it, I'm going to do my best to personally follow up with you and to con uh, connect with um, our speakers today to see if they can answer the questions for you. Um, I would really like to thank our guests today, Janine and um, Mashi and Mira, who I'll throw up back on the screen just so you remember what she looks like. <laughs> um, and I would like to thank Janelle Orsi for connecting me with the speakers um, and the Postcarbon Institute for letting us use their webinar platform. And of course, I would thank all of you for taking time out of your busy day to join in this webinar. We hope that it has helped you um, get more ideas on how to get started um, and also get connected with more resources. So, so for some next steps, we will be sending out a survey asking you what you thought of this webinar. Please fill it out so that we can improve our webinar series. Um, we want to provide the best service that we can. Again, we, are, we did record this whole thing. The slides will be sent out to you. All the resources will be sent out to you. So just hold on tight. It will be in your inbox. Um, if you join New Dreams mailing list, we will let you know when we have next webinars coming up. Um, and we will actually just automatically add you into our mailing list by default. And if you um, actually don't want to get in from us, you can just unsubscribe. And please go out and start your time bank. We need to have more of these around the country and all over the world. If you have any questions, um, please um, email me. You're welcome to email me directly at when at newdream.org. Um, and also I'll keep this window open a little bit longer so those of you who are chatting with each other, you can like maybe like make connections that way. But thank you so much, everyone. Really, really, really excited about the turnout. Um, and I hope that everyone um, goes out and starts more time banks. So thanks again, everyone. Have a wonderful day. And uh, this concludes our webinar. Bye.